this conversation, Thomas explains that if the problem of the present is the discontinuity between the human and the non-human, the way of the future is through continuity. In other words, humans must be present to the planet in a mutually enhancing manner. This process of moving into what Thomas calls the Ecozoic era is made possible through three conditions. First, we must understand that the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. Thomas notes that the more than human world is not just mechanism, for there is an inner principle through which everything has a capacity for presence, as seen in the way flowers speak to us through their beauty. The second condition is that the human is a subsystem of the earth system. This is crucial for religion, education, health, economics, law, and any other field of the human venture. As Thomas says, we can't have a sustainable human economy with a non-sustainable earth economy, for everything participates in one single organic process. The third condition of the Ecozoic is that the planet will never function in the future the way it has in the past. The human role has been irreversibly altered to the extent that humans are now involved in almost every aspect of the earth's functioning. But Thomas warns us against the tendency to drift into a technozoic world of chemicals and electronics. Instead, we need a new education program and even new language to orient ourselves to an earth community in which every being has the right to live and flourish. This is what Thomas calls the great work of our time. For our children especially, need to feel that they are called to a great work, one that is challenging, adventurous, and drawn from the deepest capacities of the human soul. So we have a situation where we are in the middle of a vast destruction, and it's based on an assumption of a discontinuity between the human and the more than human world, uh, being dynamized by a millennial vision, which is now in the historical order to create a wonder world of consumer items. So the question is now, given this, this very dire situation where, where so much destruction is taking place and it's being supported by our fundamental establishments, yeah. um, the, the challenge of our time has to be to begin to deal with this. And this is, this is, a, this is a major discussion, mm -hmm. but maybe we could, we could begin that and, and ask simply, uh, what do we do now? How do we move forward? Uh, the, the answer to the future is uh, understanding of the past. If the problem is discontinuity, the answer is continuity. It's that simple. We have to um, rethink ourselves within the planet Earth, and we have to forget saving the human and start saving the planet. It's like people in a rowboat. There may be problems with distribution of food. Somebody may be ill, but if something happens to the boat, you'd better take care of the boat because if you don't take care of the boat, everything else is irrelevant. Now, so the problem of humans is take care of the, uh, of the earth because, and the earth will take care of us. But uh, this present uh, disturbance, this present uh, assault on the planet, and all our electronics thing uh, represents a type of assault on the planet. And our, certainly our nuclear energy, it's, it's just a terrifying assault on the planet. Uh, and always we have this this overwhelming self-entrancement. Uh, we can do it. We can do it. We can go into space. We can outdo gravity. Uh, and that, I, I think, is the most uh, absurd thing, you know, outdo gravity. Uh, we can get into space, and we can go out there and all that. Well, we can do it by this stupendous exhaustion of resources and put a few people up there for a few days. But the cost of it 
is totally absurd in proportion to what is achieved. There are some things that achieve scientifically and technologically otherwise, but evaluating the whole, it's a pathology. And this whole uh, issue that we're talking about is uh, the human pathology, how it came about, and how do we cure it? The essence of the pathology is the human self-fascination with itself, and it expresses itself in this discontinuity between the non, uh, the more than human and the human, and its remedy is in a re, our discovery of the integral planet Earth. When I say save the planet Earth, I have in mind saving the planet Earth in the sense of saving the humans, because the humans are integral with the planet Earth, and uh, the planet Earth is not simply a mechanistic mode of being. There's a sympathetic relationship. There is a rapport that's needed, a sense of appreciation a sense of awe, a sense of veneration, because the earth is divine manifestation. Uh, so that when we assault the earth, we are not just assaulting a bit of matter, we are assaulting the divine manifestation. So, but religion doesn't seem to be aware of that. That's really the terrible part about contemporary religion. It doesn't know when its very foundations are being destroyed. So, the uh, the need is to um, become fascinated with the earth, to be entranced with the beauty and wonder and splendor of the earth itself. It's not uh, uh, simply a romantic thing. It's not uh, just sheer loveliness without terror. It has its affliction, its misery, its terror, its destruction. The earth uh, kills as well as vivifies. But in the total interaction between humans and the earth, there is this rapport where we can deal with and absorb uh, miseries even while we are interacting and are uh, finding ourselves strengthened by the... It's an adventure. It's an adventure in which we... Uh, can very well be die, but that's where. Why do people climb mountains? Why do they do this and that? They imperil themselves. Uh, we don't have to ask for the imperilment of life because it's there from the beginning. And so that uh, there are these difficulties. So when I talk about the earth, I'm not talking about uh, something that's just meadows of flowers and beautiful experiences of dawn and sunset and uh, walking peacefully on a tranquil seashore or something like that. I'm talking about the real challenge, the real depth of uh, responsibilities that we need to assume in this regard. So, uh, going back to the question, what do we do about it? I described uh, earlier the fact that we're at the terminal Cenozoic, and the answer is the Ecozoic, which I describe as the time when humans would be present to the planet in a mutually enhancing way, uh, a mutually enhancing mode. And that phrase, mutual enhancement, I think, uh, catches the essential aspect of the planet. If the planet doesn't func uh, function, we're not going to function. If the planet is, uh, doesn't have its well-being, humans can, can have no well-being. You cannot have well humans on a sick planet. If we don't take care of the planet, we can't take care of humans. Now, this um, uh, is the first law of all our professions, is the fact that the, the human is a subsystem of the Earth system. You cannot prosper the subsistence 
by devastating the base system. Uh, but to go back uh, just uh, to uh, something perhaps even a little more elementary is uh, in the, my statement of it, what I would say is the first condition of doing anything about the present situation is to understand that the universe, in particular the planet Earth, but the universe is a community of subjects, not a collection of objects. It's a community and a communion of subjects. That is, the non-human world or the more than human world is, is not just so much mechanism. Uh, things uh, have, uh, have an inner principle of spontaneity. They have a capacity for presence. It's why uh, when we, uh, we put flowers into a room and in some very real sense, the flowers speak to us. Beauty speaks to us. The very wood uh, that we make our furniture with, uh, it's beauty. It speaks. It, it's present to. It uh, lives in us. Uh, and that capacity to uh, to relate to, and on an intimate basis, uh, with the non-human world, or with that more than human world, or that which is the larger pattern of things that we live in, it's a capacity for presence. Everything has a capacity for presence. Everything speaks. Everything has its dignity, its attraction. Uh, so that's the first thing, is, is an attitude, an experience, an awareness, a consciousness, a relationship that can be described simply that the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection. I, I, I use subjects in this sense over against objects, not a collection of objects. Objects have no rights. Uh, subjects are, are persons, are, have the quality of uh, capacity for presence. And every being has this. So that uh, this capacity to appreciate that primary. Second thing is that to understand that the human is a subsystem of the earth system in every way, every way, whether it's in um, um, religion or morality or, um, or education or art or law or whatever, uh, the, the human is within the earth uh, system. And of course, the earth is in the solar system. But the, um, to appreciate this is elementary, say in economics. Uh, and the most absurd thing of all is that our schools of economics don't teach the first law of economics, which should be impressed on everybody that study economics have one thing that they should be impressed on the mind is a very simple thing that the human economy is a subsystem of the earth's economy and that you cannot have a sustainable human economy on a non-sustainable earth economy that simple and you cannot prosper the human economy, if the earth economy doesn't prosper, it's one system. There's not a human economy and an earth economy uh, separate from each other. It's one single economy, just like health. There's only one health system of humans and, the not, and that which is not human. There are not two health systems, a health system for humans to be achieved on a non-healthy planet it, it can't be. And a human religion 
uh, apart from the primary religion of the of the earth, uh, won't function. We become religious by joining the religion of the earth, and the earth itself um, participates in the divine. Um, and the, the total earth, including the human, is the primary sacred community. It's not two sacred communities, the human sacred community and none of not two. There's only one sacred community. There's only one health. There's only one economy. There's only one education. Um, and this education, this uh, bringing about this capacity for beings to understand each other and relate to each other in some understanding way is mutual. The non-human relates to the human. That's why uh, in a real educational program, humans and animals will be educated together. And in fact, they, they generally... Uh, have been thought of, or I don't know how widespread, but we need to understand that the emergent planet Earth and its future development depends precisely on the human component developing in relationship with, uh, with all the other components. There are not two evolutionary processes. There's only one evolutionary process. And uh, the, everything participates in it, and everything supports everything else in it. So that is the uh, important thing, and that leads into the third thing. Uh, the third condition of the Ecozoic of bringing the Ecozoic into existence. Now, the Ecozoic, we have to remember, is the period of when humans would be present to the planet in a mutually enhancing way. So that's the basic condition of, uh, of the future. And there are these three um, aspects of this mutual enhancing relationship. Now, the first one is that the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. The second is that the human is a subsystem of the earth system in every aspect. The third is that the planet earth will never again function in the future the way it's functioned in the past. So this is the most difficult thing to to manage. Uh, the uh, planet Earth has been irreversibly changed, and the human role in the universe has been irreversibly altered in these past few centuries. Now, when I say that the planet Earth will never again function in the future the way it functioned in the past, what I have in mind is that the planet Earth, until the present, has been a self-functioning process uh, where the beauty of life, the rainforests, the, uh, the oceans, the marine life, the uh, coral reefs, the, all the wonders of the planet uh, were brought into being apart from human a present, or the human presence was brought in as part of it, but apart from human control, because we didn't exist until very recently, when all this had already been accomplished. Uh, so the question is, or the difficulty is, that our intrusion into the functioning of the planet has been so profound that um, very little will happen in the future uh, where humans will not be involved. Uh, this um, has to do with something uh, I generally say in this way, 
I generally say that we cannot make a blade of grass, but there's, uh, in the future there's liable not to be a blade of grass. If humans do not accept it, uh, protect it, foster it, and in some manner, at times, assist in healing the conditions that threaten the life um, appearance. So, uh, so we, we are deeply involved, say, in the uh, future of, of the fish population. Just how we manage this is going to be a very, very difficult thing. Even wilderness has to now be protected, and it's a strange thing, a strange situation when wilderness has to be protected because wilderness of its nature is something that is outside the range of human control and is itself uh, the context in which humans function. But to think of wilderness functioning within the human context is a rather difficult concept, but uh, such is the situation. So we need to develop a new education program in fact, the Ecozoic era is so different that it's going to lead to a vast change. For instance, we need an Ecozoic dictionary. Our language has changed. Take the word society. Society now means human society. And in the future, when we say society, we've got to have a sense that the primary social context or the primary community is the integral planet Earth. And we ha this has to enter into our dictionary definition of the social order. Uh, we have to uh, think again as regards uh, governance. Uh, governance uh, is uh, primarily a thing of the total community. We need, say, uh, a a constitution for the North American continent, not simply a constitution for humans on the continent, where that which is not human has no inherent rights under our governance uh, system. We need an education, an ecozoic education, where children would be educated and become literate primarily in uh, the planetary process in the natural world, not primarily learn to read books written by humans. They would think first of the book of the universe, of the book of the earth. Uh, so they would first be given this larger context of education and the larger context of skills. And this is one of the difficulties with the electronics thing, but again, the electronics process of giving them their nature experience through television and through electronics media is not the way in which it uh, must be done. That can perhaps play a role, but this must be an immediacy of the child with the reality of uh, the world about them so that they must be uh, introduced to the natural world in this immediacy of personal presence to the reality. Uh, we're beginning to lose our sense of the reality of the thing by artificial contrived uh, substitutions. I'm told that in uh, Japan that you can, or in some countries, that they've worked out the electronics so that if you want to have an experience of the natural world, you go into a booth and you put in your quarter and you can have a, a sylvan scene or a woodland scene and you can have, hear the water flow, you can hear the singing of the birds, you can see the flowers bloom, you can have all this experience uh, through 
of the contrived processes of electronics. Now, this uh, is the kind of substitution that tends to be made. I remember once uh, in Germany, when I was there once uh, for a number of years, that uh, I was with a German family at one time that I used to visit, and the mother prided herself on reading English, and she used to get uh, some publication from America, and one of them was a religious uh, publication, and had the prayers for children on a record. And her first instinct was, is that good? A child should learn to pray by the immediacy of a human person and a human voice. And if you put this on a record and the child learns uh, that way, then there's something missing. This, the most profound aspect of education is, is lacking. So there is a tendency of humans to drift off into the technozoic order. And that's the choice that has to be made and where the future will be determined, whether we're going into a technozoic world uh, or whether we're going to ecozoic world. And the difference is largely between going into an electronics uh, chemical world or whether we are going into an organic uh, world of, of physical intimacy. The physical order has to be kept. And whereas we tend to uh, look upon what we call a spiritual mode of the transphysical order and develop a certain... Um, a sense of suspicion of the physical order as not having the meaning that the spiritual order has, uh, we are going to have to recover our sense of the grandeur and the importance of the physical mode of being and of the physical experience. Because once that goes, it's the only way in which we really become intimate with the personal element or with the spiritual or with the sacred element of things in some real way. Otherwise, I, there's a certain ephemeral aspect of our other experience, and it tends to enter into triviality. So this is what I sometimes call the great work. And keeping this authentic is uh, what is involved. Now, I sometimes give expression to this in terms of what I refer to as the historical mission of our times. Uh, first of all, though, the educational process, and children particularly, need to feel that they are called to a great work. Uh, this is what inspires. It's a challenging work. It's an adventurous process. It's a process that calls to the deepest uh, capacities of the human soul. And children particularly need to experience this. Thomas, when you describe this the situation, the impasse, and the destruction that's, take, that's taking place all around the planet, this is being dynamized by a millennial vision that has worked its way out in different ways, in Russia one way, in America another way. Um, how does your vision here about the Ecozoic um, relate to this question of millennial drive? Well, what I'd like to say here is that the... Millennial vision, once it enters into history, uh, cannot be taken out of history. In other words, that's a perennial thing. We will always be driven by millennial vision. It cannot be erased from the Western mind or 
from the dynamism of Western civilization. We have had a vision uh, that it's possible to do something about the human condition. Uh, our trouble is arising from the fact that we have uh, tried to deal with the human condition in an improper way by devastating the planet in favor of the human. But now we have to envisage the millennial vision as having its fulfillment in uh, throughout the planet Earth. It has to be an achievement of the planet Earth, not simply of humans, and it has to be a new era of interaction between the human and the earth. In fact, it was described from the beginning in terms of the trees giving forth their fruits uh, 12 times a year and so forth, an extravagant depicting of the millennial vision in terms of the blossoming of the planet earth. So this vision of a wonder world, actually this has changed in our times, in our technological society, has found its expression in terms of wonder world. It has been turned into the Disney vision. The Disney world is really a modern phase of wonder world derived from this millennial vision but transformed into plastic and into make-believe and to a humanly contrived uh, creation. In that sense, it has had, I think, a rather undesirable influence on our society because, to an extent, it satisfies um, in a in a trivial way, but uh, an ultimately unsatisfying way. But the basic idea is that we must deal with this vision. Now, the Ecozoic era must um, constitute the vision. The Ecozoic era is my sense of the direction in which we achieve uh, our uh, expression of the millennial vision. Uh, so that uh, this uh, entrances at a profound level. Now, a person might say that it takes the place in the epic, great epic stories of the goal that is to be achieved. In the Homeric thing, it's that wandering until a person gets home and this achieves a certain uh, serenity there. In Virgil, the, the vision is in the what the empire is called to do to achieve the great peace among the nations. In the medieval period, it was uh, symbolized in the great cathedrals when the divine and the human would achieve a certain intimacy with each other. In, the, in Bacon's time, it was to be achieved uh, through our control of nature, and we have put it into an industrial uh, context. We've been put it into the electronic uh, expression. But now... Uh, we need a new uh, expression that I call the Ecozoic Era, and it has an inherent fascination, uh, I think, that can uh, evoke the effort that is needed, but it will have to be presented to and made available to, particularly, I think, to younger children in a way that they uh, can appreciate. They have to have an education that uh, responds to that that need. Yeah, and that your sense is that 
this will dynamize the human venture in a way of of healing the whole earth community yeah that's the basic direction that things must move into we must once again take up a achievement of a great destiny and that is what we're called to because we have to have enormous psychic energy in order to uh, bring about the changes that are needed because we're going to have to exercise a certain deliberate uh, giving up of some of the extravagances that we have at the present time. We need to uh, go back to a more integral way of agriculture, a more integral way of, of travel. For instance, we've got to go back to things like walking or bicycling or something much more elementary than the automobile or and the airplane. Uh, there simply will not be that much fuel available. But apart from whether or not the fuel is available, the restoration of the intimate relationship of humans with each other is going to require a return to a simpler way of achieving. But the most single most difficult thing to appreciate is that this cannot be done by some uh, process moving from on top, so to speak. Uh, it cannot be organized from above or institutionally and then somehow imposed on the society. It's something that must begin at a very elementary basis of human life and then grow into its larger expression.